awesome. All right. So, what? How about what we do is we just just start talking just a little bit about about the cameras and maybe how to take uh, some pictures, take taking control away from the camera, and putting it into your own hands. So, what we'll do is we'll just quickly just talk about uh, the focusing of your cameras. the shutter halfway down, that basically is what locks the focus in place. So you can choose on these these cameras over here, the, the, the SLRs, you can actually choose to have it in manual or autofocus. And, and it's got both of like the uses. What happens actually is when you're when you're focusing, the best place to actually focus um, if you're looking for, uh, let's say you're photographing, say, over in this area over here. If, the, if let's say, for example, the middle of your, your camera, which is where you, you'll be focusing, is right on the back of that, uh, that laptop over there, you can see it's quite dark. And that means that it's going to be very difficult for the camera to actually focus. In fact, it, it focuses easiest on something that is got a high contrast and a lot of detail. Sort of situation is you can actually find something roughly the same sort of distance. Okay, focus on that. So let's say that bag over there. You just press the button halfway down, and you hold your finger down, and then you recompose to your original shot, and then you take a picture. And that'll freeze the focus in that position. And where that's useful is, say, let's say for example, uh, let's say I'm photographing Liam. Let's say he's on the right of my picture okay, and I want him in focus and I want the background blurred okay, so if I took a shot like that the middle of the camera is going to go straight past him into the background so what you want to then do is turn the camera towards him get the focus up on the halfway down recompose your camera and then take a shot from there now, if you've got a if you've got an SLR, and I'll explain in a minute how that works, but if you've got an SLR, there's a really useful technique you can use, and that is, let's say, if I'm just taking one shot of Liam, and he's on the right of my picture, then that's fine. Then I can just turn towards him, hold the focus down, recompose, and take a shot. That's okay. But if let's say I'm waiting for a particular expression, and I might need to take five or ten shots, you don't have to keep going backwards, recomposing ten times. So what you can do with the uh, with the SLRs is you get the focus, and then you pop the lens into manual focus, and that freezes the focus at that position. So then you can recompose, take as many shots as you want, and then when you're done, you just pop it back into auto focus. That's very useful as long as you don't move, or he doesn't move, the focus is going to stay the same. So with your focusing. For the SLRs, what you can actually do is you can choose which part of the lens you're going to focus through. So you can either choose what's called a spot focus, which is directly in the centre, or you can choose multi points, or you can choose a point, say, to the side. And that then will allow you to focus specifically on what you're after. Now my, my suggestion to you is keep it in spot focus, because that way you know exactly where it is all the time. And you can just, if you've got to pick your camera up in a hurry, you know exactly where it is. You just press it down, freeze it, and you have multi points in average is about. That way, you know, like if you. Sorry, these are settings on the camera. You can switch to a different mode, at least different focus. Yeah, so, so what you can do, you, anyone with, a, with an SLR, what you can do is if you, if you turn your camera, say, to put it on the. Um, on yeah. the A, the A I've got nine focusing points on, but I can actually manually select which one I want. So, so I think what he's saying is just select the centre one, just the focusing points. So yeah. when you look at the viewfinder, they'll it's actually light up yeah. when you press the shutter halfway down. That's what it's called. 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 It's
If you, if you have a look through your auto focus mode, you'll see that you can move that focusing around. You know where it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know where it is, Katie. Yeah, but it mine doesn't seem to be changing. Is, are you in manual focus? Yeah, or what? Uh, manual. Yeah, if you put in auto focus, it should come up because it's. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're in, stick it back in auto focus because it doesn't come up when it's. Yeah, because you're in auto focus. Come and have a look. My focus decided not to work today. It's completely died again. It's happened before. Oh, yeah, this, uh, this is. Uh, yeah, this is. I have to go through my menu? Yeah. You, okay. With, with this one, you've got to go to the uh, custom function city. Okay. And go to auto focus. And then if you go to. To, you go to that custom yeah, function yeah. Thing, and then you've got to um, just get that to register okay. and switch that off um, and that one off and switch that on and then just apply and it should come back now. Yeah, it it's registered. So basically, what uh, what that does is you can actually then choose yeah, the points yeah, that you yeah. focus through. Now, if you say spending half a day photographing someone or something that's on the right, you might then shift that little thing over. You can see over here. If you go through, hold, hold that uh, little bit on the right. Hold that one in. Then turn the dial. So you can actually choose which point you focus through. Right? So if if you if you're finding that you're not getting enough detail, and especially at night time, you'll find sometimes your camera won't take a shot because it's too dark. Just turn and find a position that's roughly the same distance. Get the focusing. Pop it onto manual focusing and just keep taking your shots. And it's also quite useful. I've found in practice it's quite useful to do that as well because you might not have the time to keep refocusing, especially if there's a lot of commotion with cops and that sort of thing. If you know roughly the distance that it's at, just pop it in manual focus so the camera can just be just far enough. Um, so, yes, uh, I've got it. And I'll fill the camera along. So I'll show you. I'll show you basically the, just the fundamentals of what allows you to get a to, allows you to get a good exposure. When you when you're in program mode, basically the camera's deciding everything for you. Right? So what what you want to do is, if you can, try and shift over to the semi-automatic or the manual mode. So, like, let's say again, if I'm taking the shot over here and I'm in program, the camera might choose the particular focus and the particular settings. So, if I'm trying to say the head's jumping up and down, I want to get a shot in blurred, the camera's not going to understand that it's going to just choose an average of the settings. I won't understand that's exactly what I'm trying to do. 
So there's three basic features that control your exposure in photography. It doesn't matter how expensive your equipment is. These three features will uh, control everything. All the other buttons are just add-ons for tweaking those three features. To get a good exposure, what that generally means is getting a shot where you're going to get your whites being white and your blacks being black. So if you, if you have a look over in that direction there, you can see it's, there's a bright area just on that white uh, uh, fence over there. And you can see maybe up on the traffic lights there, it's quite dark. And you can see the grey pavement, the darker grey road, etc. Basically, when you're taking a shot, you want to be able to see your blacks. To get a good exposure, you want your blacks to turn out deep black and you want your whites to turn out bright whites. If your blacks are turning out all grey, then you've got too much light coming in. And if your whites are turning out not white enough, then your shot's underexposed. So you can either over or underexpose. So when you talk about a good exposure, you're basically getting a good range between the bright white and dark black. And the best way to think about it is like you can think about say black and white movies, you get the range from white to black and you get all the grey tones, all the, the um, light and greys through the mid tones up to the dark greys and then to black. Now to get a to get a, a good exposure, what you need to do is you need to actually choose so I'll just I'll just start off and just explain why the camera is called an SLR. And the reason it's called an SLR, it stands for single lens reflex. And up until the 1980s, all the cameras had two lenses. And so basically, the lens that you'd be looking through wasn't necessarily the lens that was going to be taking the picture. I don't know if you remember the days of the old 110 cameras and that sort of thing where take a shot and someone's head would be chopped off very easily and that sort of thing. That's because you, you, you have like a car so you'd be looking through here, yeah. so I think I'd get you in the picture being time the lens to take a picture. So they developed the SLR so what you're actually looking through, the viewfinder, that's what you're going to see, that's the picture you're going to get, so it's totally accurate. And the way they devised it was Basically, it's not easy to see with the film camera, right? You have the light coming through the lens, all right? And that hits inside all of your, your cameras. There's a little mirror over there. And the light basically bounces off the mirror, comes up through here as a little prism, bounces off there, and comes out through the viewfinder. So what you actually see is directly bouncing off that mirror over there. That's why it's a single, single lens reflex. And when you take a shot, as soon as you press the shutter, that click that you're hearing is two things. One, as you take the shot, that mirror shoots up, and the light comes directly straight through onto your sensor. If it's digital, it's all filmed if, it's on, if you're using a film camera. So that's a single lens reflex, that's what that is. Now, there's three things that control your exposure. First thing is your shutter. Actually, we'll talk about your ISO first. So your ISO basically is the sensitivity of your sensor. Okay? Now, as a general rule of thumb, you want to keep it as low as possible. Uh, if you remember the days of film, you'd go like on a bright day, you'd purchase 100 ISO film, and on a dark day, like a cloudy day, you'd purchase 400 ISO film. That was because 100 ISO was less sensitive to light. You don't need it as sensitive on a bright day. And 400 on a cloudy day, you need it more sensitive. So the sensor and the digital camera works in exactly the same way. The lower the number, the less sensitive. And the higher the number, the more sensitive it is. But if you think about your, your stereo system, when you turn the speakers right up, you start to get loud volume, but you're also getting hissing coming through your speakers. So with your with your uh, your digital sensor, the higher you make your ISO, the more what's called digital noise you're going to get through your image. So you want to try and even though it says it goes up to 3200 ISO or 1600 ISO, whatever it is, it's a bit like a car saying it does 300 kilometers an hour and then at 160 it starts to wrap. Yeah, you can 
So you want to keep it down as low as possible. You also get much stronger colour on a lower higher side. Colours turn out much more vivid the lower the number. So general rule of thumb. First thing you set is your high so keep it down as low as possible. Nice number. Okay, the next of the three features is your shutter speed. And your shutter speed basically every time you press press the shutter release, that mirror locks up. And these shutter blades over here, they open and they close. So of course you're gonna get light coming through once it opens up and you can control how long it stays open for. The longer it is, the more light you're going to get through to the sensor. The quicker it is, the less light. Okay. But it also controls a second feature and that's movement. The longer you keep your shutter open, if someone is walking in front of it, it blows on your sensor. Set your shutter speed really quickly, you freeze it. Now, the, the, these three features are all work in sync. When you have a balanced exposure and you've got the numbers for each of them, if you change one of them, you're going to affect the other. So, you can imagine if you've got a, if you decide to have a lower ISO, getting less sensitive, and you decide that you want to freeze the movement of your image. That means you've got less light from your ISO, you've got less light from your shutter speed. That means you're going to have to compensate someone else in the third feature. And so they're all working sync like it's on the season. Now the third of the features. <laughs> the third of the, the three features is what's called your aperture. Inside of all of your lenses, you can see over here. Diameter opening and closing, and that's called your aperture. Now, your aperture, as well, the similar to your shutter speed, controls two things as well. Of course, the amount of light, the, the smaller it is, the less light. But what it also controls is what's called your depth of field, how much you've got in focus in your image. And again, that's useful. Say, let's say I'm taking a portrait again and I want to blur out the background. Let's say the background is not important. Okay. Then I would set it on an aperture that just focuses on what's important in your image and you blur out the background. And that way, because what you want to do is you want to keep the viewer focused on what's important in your shot. You don't want to have unnecessary information. A common mistake a lot of people make is they're thinking what's important in their image without realizing that the person that's looking at the image might not be the same thought space as them. So when they look at the image, they're seeing all the background plus all the foreground, etc. and you've already lost the interest of the viewer because it's just too much to look at. So you would blur the background out of the tiny foot. If the background is relevant, when you're trying to get a sense of space, you know, getting a sense of telling the story of the whole space, then you would have a much more depth of field. Wide angle lenses, you can Well, you, you can blur out the background with a wide angle lens if you get very close to this. So, if you have a look over here, and you probably see, switch, switch, on, switch on your cameras onto, onto the A mode, and just turn the dial. You'll see the dial moves between the lowest number might be 3.5 or whatever it is. And it shifts all the way up probably to 22. Can you like leave it at the top Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just I think it's TV. Yeah. Oh, it's EV. Yeah, just pop yeah. it on that one. So, the easiest way to remember with the numbers is that the lower the number, the shallower your depth of field. The higher the number, longer your depth of field. But there's a little twist with the aperture and that is that the lower the number, okay, the shallower the depth of field, but you can see there's a lot more light coming in. The higher the number, you've got a long depth of field but less light coming in. An easy way to remember it 
is when you've got uh, the light rays, because what happens is when it's wide open, you've got light rays coming in in all different directions like this. And they will focus a lot closer to the lens over here. So you're actually going to get a very shallow depth of field. With the, light, with the higher number, you've got the light rays that are coming more direct, and they're going to focus further back. You're going to have a long depth of field. So, shutter speed, longer it, longer it's open, the more light you're going to get in, and you're going to get more movement. The aperture also affects two things. The lower the number, the more light it lets in, and the shallower your depth of field that you want to absorb. Um, I, after, after TAFE, because like, I learned that quite early in TAFE, I came up with a little ditty. So the, the less the light, so the least the amount, less the light, less the number, less the amount of objects. So that was just how I ultimately remembered it, was there's less light, the lower the number, because that always confused me that a lower number would be wider. I always expected it to be the other way around. Well, so. no, no, no number's going to be... Oh, sorry, yeah, that's what so, I meant. Sorry, so, I, I always yeah, thought no number would be smaller. Yes. As opposed to a small number being a big number being small. Yes. So, it's in the way, yeah, it's quite yes. 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 Yes, it's, yeah, it's uh, from memory, it is the, God. The distance from like one yeah, third yeah. or something. Yeah, it's, a, it's the hyperfocal distance. Hyperfocal? Yes, which is, God. Length of your lens plus. Really. Basically, an easy way to remember it, <laughs> an easy way to remember it is. <laughs> the maths of it. Where, you, wow. where you're focusing, right? So let's say your depth of field is, say, from here out that way. Best place to focus is 130 to your depth of field. Okay, so you're looking for the place to actually focus. Focus 130 to your depth of field. One third towards you and two thirds behind is what's in front. So if you want, you can you can just you can test it out if you want. Okay, pop it in, in the aperture priority, say in the A V and your camera. Does it happen on yours? So if you, if you test it out, right, so if you find yeah. something very really close to you, yeah, like yeah, you yeah it's going to be like macro-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Macro-ish, like, it's a CME macro-ish. So press the shutter screen, press the shutter. Yep, yeah, well what you can do is... Uh, yeah. So the white one you have here, whatever, then the shutter speed. Yeah, I've got the light. The camera adjusted the ISO. Alright. Well, you can put up your ISO on 400. And 400 is what we can do now. So you can put your ISO on 400. So what you can do is just test this out. So take, take this in. Yeah, just put it in. So you can test it out here. Yeah. You want it to be a Take a shot. Now do the same thing. 
and I'll shift, I'll shift that up to yeah, so obviously when you change your aperture, whichever speed will change accordingly. Basically, every sort of f stop change, I can set stop down from say 4.5 to 3.5. That's actually half the amount of light from the moon to the end. So the seven speed doesn't change accordingly. So if I go from say one tenth of a second to one twentieth of a second, because it's automatically maintaining the same exposure. Fairly similar, fairly similar. I mean, once you I start getting it, it doesn't take much to shift between. Yeah, it's fairly tiny. How you put it up here? It's a bit up here. 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 So with, the, so with with the uh, with the aperture, so that's that's useful when you like I was saying when you want to blur out the background. So especially it's good too if you're taking portraits and you want to get something fairly, you want to get the depth of field fairly shallow. Now, as uh, what was your name again? Keith. Keith. As Keith was saying. You can actually, if you're using, say, F4, right, so it's a very shallow depth of field, and, you, and you're photographing, let's say, a 40 millimeter lens on F4, you're going to find that the background is going to be blurred, but not, not too blurred, right? If you're using, say, for example, a 100 millimeter lens, and you've got it on F4, okay, what a 100 millimeter lens is, See, let me go back one step. What your eye sees, this, this is called your focal length on your, on, your, on your lens. Roughly what your eye sees is about 35 to 40 millimeters. So anything less than that pushes everything out. You get a wider angle, wider angle of view. And anything longer than that, anything greater than that, basically brings everything in. So telephoto brings it all in. But what it does is on a, on a Telephoto, it actually compacts everything at a wider angle, pushes it out. Yep, so that's, that's a telephoto. It's a great way to do that. It's an expensive way to do that, it's so bad. So <laughs> you can see over here, okay, so 200 millimeters basically is going to draw everything in closer. But what it does as well is it compresses everything. So if you've got F4 on 200 millimeters, you're going to have a very, very small amount in focus. F4 on a wider angle, you're still going to have a lot more in focus. So if you are using, if you are using a, a wide angle lens, and let's say I want to photograph. So, so let's say you're photographing, a, you're photographing at a demonstration, and you might want to get, say, someone that's being arrested. Focus, right? But you don't want to keep using 200 millimeters 
bricks are holding in place so you only see it's head and shoulders. You want to get the scene as well, right? You just want to have it a little bit blurred out because you want to concentrate on what's important. So you can then use, if you, if you use a wide angle lens, which will give you that angle, right? But you've got to then get in close. So similar to a 200mm lens, it draws it all in. You're basically, in effect, you're coming close like a 200mm that way you can focus very close to the subject. So when you've got a wide angle lens, you've got f4 on the two different uh, on the two different lenses, two different focal lengths, they have a different effect. So what happens is like for say f4, let's say uh, let's say I'm photographing say from here to here. Okay? You photograph your your uh, point of focus is one third. Thanks. Your point of focus is one third, okay, between there and there, because one third towards you and two thirds behind is going to be in front. Okay. Right. So that's your point of focus there. Now, if you've got say two point eight, f two point eight, you're going to get that much in focus. F four, that much. Five, six, eight, eleven, sixteen, twenty-two. So it moves out of your point of focus. The optimum focus point. The optimum focus. Is of course, oh, focus point. it gradually loses focus as it gets further out from that point of focus. So, with um, with uh, with your aperture, it's a very very useful tool to get the viewer to concentrate on what's important. Yeah. So, so, the yeah. Basic, so basically, you've got you've got the three things: you got your ISO, you got your aperture, and you got your shutter speed. Okay, and they they all work in sync with each other. So like I was saying, if you've got a very low ISO, okay, so it's not sensitive to light, and you've got an aperture that's very small, let's say you're getting a long depth of field, that means to compensate for the less light that's coming in, you're going to have to have a long shutter speed to get this for a long period of time. What's that? Okay. So I brought up, uh, Keith just mentioned about camera shake. Now what that means is, if you've got a shutter speed of say 200th of a second, okay, you're going to freeze everything in your subject. Remember I was saying the longer your shutter is open, the more movement you're going to get. It's not only movement of the object in front of you, it's also movement of your hands. No matter how steady you think your hands are, you'll always always pick up movements, which is why you use a tripod. Now generally as a rule of thumb, you set your shutter speed at roughly about a 60th or 125th of a second, you should stop all camera shape. Okay. Except if you've got a longer lens like that, what you want to do is you want to set it for a minimum of the maximum that that lens goes to. So if it goes to 200 millimeters, you set your shutter speed at a minimum of 200 milliseconds. Of course, it all depends on the weight of the lens. Yeah. Okay. And generally, like you, if you set this, say, for example, at 40 millimeters, it's quite a heavy lens. So you're going to need a bit more weight. The camera's a bit heavier, you're going to need a bit more weight. So you've got to go by the weight of the lens and the weight of the camera. Yeah. So you generally want to find a shutter speed that is going to be on roughly around 125 of a second on average. Anything below that, either use a tripod or you want it to be quite steady. Hold your, your arms close to your body like that, okay? or you can always find something like a tree. You can move against just to steady the camera. Like that. Yeah, I've tried that and it's just shut down. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, it does help if you if you're on say it's like thirtieth of a second. Yeah. Okay. If you, maybe if you're on a one second or half a second, yes. Yeah. But if you're on a thirtieth of a second, which is just borderline, you'll find that it, it, it's just that little bit of extra steadiness will make a big difference. What's that? Uh, I have used it, but uh, are they helpful? Or? They're helpful, um, not if you're going to have a very long shutter speed. Because uh, uh, yeah. I thought maybe that would be much better because 
less because my tripod's so big and heavy and hard to carry around. It takes forever to set up. And then I thought they sort of one whole things would be so much easier because they look simple. Yeah, I think it was a big so it, you know again if you're around a 30th of a second and it just gives you a little bit of extra steadiness that can make a difference yeah if it's a long period of time you're going to need a tripod but if like if it's like one second the subject might not be missed anyway it might i mean it might not what you can find sometimes even in one second you might have someone dead still looking at something or whatever it is and you get movement in the background which can make quite an interesting picture. And you'll find all the buildings will be static. You get movement of people. Which can make it quite interesting. But when I was photographing when Jerry occupied the sleep over and people were asleep and I'd have a 30 second exposure and no movement from people asleep. And then the other people that were moving around in the background would get this sort of movement in the background. So you can create something quite interesting. You can also find, like, say, for example, during the daytime, you can photograph. You get someone, you can go and photograph someone standing in the road there, dead still, and they'll be frozen in your shot, and then you'll get absolutely no cars or people around at all because everything else is moving, and it'll look like it's been shot, you know, at uh, Sunday at 8 in the morning or something. There's no one around. So you can make some interesting effects using the shutter speed as well as the aperture. Each one's got its own particular function. Now, there's another thing that you, that, uh, you can use which, which can be quite handy and that's uh, white balance. And what your white balance does is, um, there's a thing called color temperature in photography. And what that is, What happens is during daytime, middle of the day, you get a, a, a sunlight, which is a very clear white light. Now, earlier in the, in the morning and later in the afternoon, the color changes okay, according to the sun's rays. When it's a cloudy day and you've got the light passing through the clouds, your camera will pick up all the blue lights okay, because it gets filtered through the clouds. What your white balance does is it actually adjusts the white balance, the color temperature, back to it's fairly close to a daylight. If you're photographing indoors and you've got, say, a light bulb, you probably found that it turns out quite orange shots. So what the camera does is it adds, if you put it on the, on the indoor light bulb on your white balance setting, it adds a, like a blue filter, a blue hue to the shot, which is the opposite to, to orange or red balances it out. When you're photographing fluorescent, which is more of a green tinge to it, it adds a magenta filter, which is a light blue, and that's the opposite of the spectrum that balances that out. Our eyes don't really see it because our brain's just corrected for us. Are they um, settings where we want to make a or is that Well, on, on film cameras, what you used to have to do is put an actual filter over the top of it. Yeah, it's just a now, soft picture. Well, now you can put it, you can change it in your camera to start off, or you can change it later on using a color temperature slider. When you're changing up the camera, it's still just a soft picture. It's, it's still what? It's still a soft picture. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it basically it just shifts it over towards one color. Yeah. But what you can do is you can actually use it as, as a creative tool as well. So if you're photographing someone, say it's a rainy day and you want to add the effect of coldness, etc., you can shift it over a little more to the blue end. If it's if you're taking a shot of a portrait that's more bright, more happy and whatever, you can put it on the cloud setting, which makes it a little bit warmer. So you can use it creatively, not only just to correct it, but you can use it in a, in a way to enhance your images as well too. Um, what else do you need to explain? Good idea also, especially when you're doing protest photography, to have a filter over the front of your lens. Because if you damage that, you want to damage your filter and not the actual front element of the camera. What filters do you use? Or just to protect the 
that was smaller than well you can, most of them will be a skylight or uv which cuts out a bit of the uv glare yeah, which you sometimes notice sometimes don't pretty much mostly it's there yeah, as a protection yeah. my suggestion too is if you have a lens hood to keep it on all the time as well too you know, if you're not bumping something you know, it's really handy so, you know, again you're just protecting the lens you drop it all or whatever um, what else is there? Um, also, if you if you're doing uh, uh, practice photography, it's also I keep my camera the drive will be on a faster shooting like that. Um, and the reason the reason I do that is that sometimes you will find well, it's useful for, for, for two reasons. One. You might find the one shot that you get if you're just taking one shot that maybe the cops blinked or the protesters blinked yeah and that can be the difference between a good shot or a bad shot yeah. so just taking two or three shots can sometimes just cover you just for that instant that you might find that the, the person blinked also you will find too that it just did within the split second timing you can have a whole change in composition in your shot you can have the difference between maybe a hand being like that and a hand being like that in your shot. And that can be a big difference in terms of making your shot a lot stronger or not. And with digital these days, it doesn't cost any more to be taking an extra few shots compared to days of film. So keep it, on, keep it on that. Now, when you have it on consecutive shooting, it's for consecutive shooting, but it fires one, one shot after the next. Every time you hold that down and you're in auto focus, it keeps and focuses and then tries to refocus again for the next one and the next one. Oh. So if you are taking many shots of one thing and you've really worked at the distance, keep it in manual focus because then it doesn't waste time trying to refocus all the time. It'll just fire off a lot quicker. Yeah. It won't try and refocus each time. So that's where that manual focus is quite handy as well too. I tend to find uh, wide angles quite good, especially in protest situations, and that's especially because if you've got, say, an arrest going on, a lot of the time the cops, you're aware of things subconsciously because everybody's thinking in quick mode. If you're going to cut point directly like that, they're thinking they're being photographed. I could get Bob pointing my camera in that direction there, and if the cop isn't quite aware of what's going on, I'm actually getting him in focus, I mean, getting him in my shot. But he doesn't necessarily realise it with a wide angle lens. So it can be quite handy having your camera pointing like that, and he thinks I'm taking a shot over there, but I'm actually getting him in the shot as well, too, which is very useful for wide angle. Um, what else? Uh, now, you can shoot. So there's pro Would that be the range that the lens that you use? This one? Yep. Uh, uh, it, it varies. It varies, yeah. It, you know, you can use a, an extreme wide angle. Uh, generally speaking, you want something that gives you a wide enough angle and long enough to as a telephoto. So, you know, around this sort of range, up to 200 is perfectly fine. You don't generally that. Where it is useful to have a longer range lens, Similar to having the wide angle, if you've got a situation where there's an arrest going on, and if you're, and we'll talk about, you know, being in the line of, of uh, getting in the way of the cops, which then means you can potentially be arrested, you might then want to use a lens that gives you the opportunity to stay back a little bit. You can photograph from a distance without being in their way, they've got no reason to come up to you and hassle you. So you can keep a longer lens on there and still get what you want. Yeah, out of their lenses, which I've got on the side, it's good. They are. They are. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just got to work around it. Just push your ISO up a little bit. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Claire, do you want to maybe mention Prime lenses as well? Yes. Yes. Mention what's that? This is a Prime lens. Prime lens. It's 750. Just to say, this is a lens I used a lot at night here because yep. it was so fast and actually pick up a lot of lights. Yep. And um, obviously, this lens at night, it's like pushing everything's dark. Is it 1.8? No, it's 1.4, so it's really yeah. fast. Yep. So it's great at night. So that's yep. why I would switch lenses around 6 or 7 o'clock. Yes. So I could still pick up everything at night. Yeah, so it, it gives you that aperture, it's much wider open, so it allows you to photograph it in low 
alone like situations. Yep. What might have a distance? What's that? So what's a motor car? The prime lenses. There's no zoom. Yeah. So it's 50 millimeter prime. So what the changes is being able to But if the you thing is they're really fast. The average lens goes down to about five or seven. So what's the um, what's the maximum distance? Uh, well, you've got a basic. Yeah. Uh, six feet, eight feet. Uh, Are you talking about no, how no. close you can get? Yeah. Oh, right. well, well, how far? Well, if far at infinity, all the lens will focus yeah. at infinity. Yeah. But the, the, where you would maybe use something like that is. You know, if you don't mind the shot not being too wide, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? so you, you, you lose a little bit of your angle of view, yeah. but that's fine, you just move back a little bit, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas zoom is useful is if you want to get the, the correct composition. Yeah. Now, it's also a good idea when you're photographing in protests, as much as that's a pain in the ass to carry around, it's a good idea to always have a spare battery that's always important to charge. And if you can, like a couple of cards as well too. Um, I didn't bring a card reader along. But uh, it's always a good idea when you're loading your photos from the card to not use the camera. Don't run a cord from the camera into the laptop. Yep, right. Thank you. So this is a card reader. So you take your card from in here. That's what you can go off to. <laughs> Okay, so this will fit into the card reader, yeah. and you run the cord from the card reader into it. It's much faster. It's straight on the lens, right? Oh, so you're connecting the camera straight yeah. to the computer. Yeah, if you connect the camera oh, straight to the camera. computer, yeah. it takes a lot longer. Yeah. And it's a lot more wear and tear on your camera as well, too, which, which is unnecessary. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's I didn't a lot, realize that. Yeah, it's a lot, lot quicker to use money. And you can get these for $19, $20. Oh, wow, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Now, one thing I, I forgot to mention as well is when you're taking your lens off, just be careful, just make sure that your camera is switched off because there's a vacuum inside the camera. Yeah. And every time you take the lens off, it sucks dust in. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is get dust on there. You know, you've got to spend a lot of time when, when you shut, so shut the camera off. Switch the camera off when, you, when, you take, when you're changing lenses. Otherwise, Otherwise it sucks dust in. If you get dust on the sensor. Um, these days, cameras say they've got this auto dust. Yeah, it's like a course. bit of a shape. Yeah. yeah, it gets a bit of a vibration. Yeah. But you still use the brush. Yeah, it's, a, it's still a good idea. Like you, can, you can never avoid getting dust. And yeah. some sticks more than others. It's a good idea to be able to get to use a light brush. And there's also some that have a, a sense of cleaning thing itself, too. Yeah. Next is, is uh, just a little bit of composition, which is really important for, for an interesting shot. Because you can take it, you can take a shot that is technically very good. You know, it might be correct focus. So it's going to with my contact lens. You can take a shot that's technically very focused, uh, good exposure, but it's a boring shot. The most important uh, rule with composition is keep it simple. The viewer to concentrate on what's important. There's different elements in composition that will create its guidelines, you know, and it's always a good idea to learn some of the rules in the beginning, and you can always throw them away later on. Put them to the back of your mind, and you can apply them when you need them. Now, if you think about, say, like what a painter does with a painter paints within a frame. Everything that a painter paints in a frame, they actually intend on the viewer seeing. There's nothing they're going to put in there that they don't want the viewer to see. So if you think about your composition in the same sort of way, a lot of people are so used to just picking up a camera and taking a shot, and they're not aware of other things that are going on. So if I say, for example, I'm going to take a shot over here, and I've got someone standing over there, and I'll take the shot, you can see there's a bright orange which is kind of in the background there. Yeah. So when you take that shot, the viewer's eye is going to go straight to the bright orange, which is that. And you might have a very interesting portrait, like an interesting expression on the person's face, 
that the new has already gone to the witch's hand. So what you want to do is one of two things. One, use your aperture to blur it out. Okay, so you defocus it a little bit. Or change your position. So try and get used to, when you're looking through the viewfinder, try and get used to thinking about what's actually inside your viewfinder. Do you want the shot to look that way? Not always the first position that you're standing in is going to be the most interesting. Try and walk you know, to the side a few steps or the other side a few steps. Pick a different angle, go higher, pointing down, yeah. go lower, pointing up. Yeah. Even sometimes like when you're at a protest and you've got a whole line of people and you can't get past, you don't always have to have your camera on, on, on the viewfinder. Stick your hand over the top, take a few shots, see what it looks like. You might have to adjust the lens a little bit more that way, you know? You know, it doesn't always have to. Your mind doesn't always have to be, you know, attached to it. Yeah. Sometimes you might get a good angle just putting your camera around. Or something. To get wide angles, something. Wide yeah. angles are good for that. Yep. Yeah. But again, you've got to be. If you're trying to focus on something in particular, you've got to be fairly close to your subject. And don't forget to the wider the angle, the more distortion you get. Okay. When you say distortion, what do you mean by that? If you get a sort of an elongation. So if you've got, oh, okay, if you've got okay. someone, you don't want to photograph a portrait yeah. with a wide angle lens because yeah. you're going to get people's heads being distorted. So best to try and avoid that, what you can do is keep the person in the center. Yeah. If you look at the way the lens is inside there, yeah. it's flatter in the front yeah. as you get less distortion. It's, it's angled more on the side over there, so that's, that's where you're going to get your distortion. Yeah, but see how... Oh, yeah, 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 I get it. Cool. Yeah. That's got absolute... Just, I mean, not absolute, it's not a pure fish eye, but it definitely curves around the edges, and it's yeah. definitely unflattering for portraits, <laughs> because it can elongate or stretch it, like, yes. not so much like a funny mirror, but yeah. not far off. But that was great for like Hyde Park, you know, when we had the whole situation yeah. with Hyde Park because like you were saying, I was able to get my hand over the top while they're dragging people away and just snap, 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 without having to worry who's in focus, who's not, do I even have any view because it's so wide and I was in so close that I knew I had everything within the, the frame itself. Cops were doing the same thing too, but when we got the banners and put the banners up so the cops couldn't see us, they actually had cameras on poles right. that they yeah. were sticking That's over right. the top. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny, wasn't it? And then through the hole. Yeah, through well. the hole. Yeah. 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 We actually applauded their ingenuity of, um, of being able to think about putting it And they had a good sense of humour too. Yeah, well, for a little while. <laughs> About 20 minutes later, not so much. Yeah. Dear Lord, and then somebody put a tent up. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get those yeah. evil people. So with the with composition, some you know, just some other little pointers. Keep in mind other things like uh, different elements like uh, texture. Texture is very important. Think of shapes. Look up at the buildings over here, you can see all the different shapes up on here. You can have uniformity or contrasting shapes. Your colours, you can have contrasting colours. Subconsciously your eyes, your, your eyes will move between opposite colours. So if you've got someone dressed in blue and someone else dressed in yellow, your eyes are going to shift directly across the photo. You want to actually engage the viewer in your shot. You want to keep them interested in your shot. So you don't want to say, you know, let's say uh, from Bob over here, let's say I'm photographing like this, and this is my frame over here. I'm not going to photograph him to the side of my image. Just the viewer looks at his eyes and then looks straight out of the picture. So I'd rather frame it that way. So I get him on the left hand side. So the viewer looks straight there, and then you wonder where he's going to get to actually looking across there. Of the model. It was like sort of picking up things that wasn't capable of actually something. You are, you, you're probably one of the most well photographed people around here. I'm going to put out like a fashion book. Of Bob. Yeah, yeah. Bob. Yeah. Bob. Bob. Yeah. Bob. Fashion Bob. Fashion Bob. 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 Bob.
This is Bob in summer. This is Bob in winter. Think in terms of lines. Yep. And perspective. Yep. Going, going off. And you want to phrase it. Thinking in terms of those lines and phrasing around that. So in the case of Bob looking. Um, I say about that is that if he's on the left, his line of sight is right. the centre. That's right. A lot of composition seems to be about lines converging. Converging. Yes. And so if he's on the left, his line of sight is converging to the centre. Yeah. And so if he's on the right, all the lines are not meeting in the middle of That's right. No, so is it right. like making triangles in well, a sense? Well, yeah, like triangles. There's all different rules in composition. There's, yeah. a, there's a rule of thirds as well too, okay. where you can divide the the frame up into thirds going that way and oh, thirds okay. going so that your, way. Your camera should actually so show you can that. put someone on, on one side or the other side or their horizon and put them in the bottom. That's okay. The top. And the reason you do that instead of keeping it, you don't want to have a shot that's looking necessarily too balanced. If we get too balanced, people are going to lose interest. People sort of want to know what's going on if something doesn't look quite right. So you have it just a little bit to the side or a little bit to the other side. Same with the horizon. You don't want it 50 50. It's too balanced. So if you've got a you know, a sky that's blue like this, it's not too interesting. So minimize that, concentrate on the, on the ground. One third sky, okay, two thirds uh, ground. So if you've, got, if you've got clouds that are very interesting, have two thirds sky, yep. one third ground. You can just create a video. Oh, 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 you got one person to the side and they're looking over that way and the other person's looking down there, it's not going to make for a very interesting shot. Whereas if you wait just a couple of moments, you might find there's a split second where those two people might be looking towards that person. And you've got a shot that is tied up. Everything, all the elements are tied in together. And that, that sort of shot is, uh, there's a, a photographer that coined a phrase called the decisive moment. At that moment, it just captures everything, sums everything up that's been before and everything that's about to come. It's just that big moment. And you capture the mood or the intensity or expression, whatever it is in the shot. Oh, this race we were, I was, I was in front of the race, uh, and like we were doing multiple laps around the same circuit. And I came up to this corner, and there were people on the hill. And I looked at them, and as, a, as I looked at the people, I thought, fuck, where the heads are was black. Right? That meant they weren't looking at me, they were looking around the corner where I couldn't see. And I slowed down. If I didn't, I would have ploughed into the cars around the corner, like, and like, you know, looking at the crowd. If they're looking at you, you've got white faces. You know, you've got the white of their faces. Yeah. If, if the back of their heads to you, there's something over there, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, I'll, 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 yeah, subconscious. But they might have a case. Uh, and a lot of it is suggesting you're leaning like you know we all operate very similarly to perception wise and vision wise and understand that's what they do in advertising all the time play around with colors and you know different spheres etc 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 because we do all operate on and something to keep in mind too when you when you're photographing your protest as well, it's always a good idea if you're going to get a shot of say someone getting arrested and that sort of thing, you also want a sense of place. 
So if you can manage to find an angle where you get a banner in the background that actually tells the story of the arrest, yeah. try and tie everything in. And even sometimes you can get, you know, like if you're not behind the camera, get someone, when you see the media there, get someone to hold a banner. Yeah. Because even if it gets shown on the news, they can say what they want about the protest. Yeah, if there's a banner right. behind that actually directs the message yeah. to yeah. the viewer, yeah. they can't necessarily, you know, as easily distort the message. Yeah. So that's always important. Trying to find a good banner or something that is going to tell the story. A very important thing, um, especially in protest photography, is finding symbols. Find symbols that are actually going to conceptualise what you're trying to do. Think about what sort of message you're trying to get across with it. Because just an arrest is just an arrest. Yeah. You don't necessarily know what it's about. It could mean something that's stolen in the bag or it mean anything. If you've got a bit of a story to it, it could be something, a sticker on someone. Yeah. You know, someone standing in the background, etc. Et that's interesting. That's, that's interesting from the protest point of view too. Yeah. If you happen to be the one with the, with the placards, if you see cameras around yeah. there. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's a kind of pose. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I did that actually. Uh, I think we had two rallies. It was the second rally. And I made a placard, which I had in the first week, which turned out to be very popular, which said, have you seen my social contract? I can't find it anywhere. And then I had, I deliberately, so I'm an MT, and I, I deliberately took the covers off my legs, and I wore shorts, and they were poles, and they just, be this stick thing about a prosthetic leg sticking out in front of the banner. So it had this message with the social contract. This is a person walking with this placard on prosthetic legs. And I thought, well, that's going to you know, yeah. capture it. But as you say, uh, you know, the media might want to distort something. They might just not take the photo because yeah. it, might, it might convey a message. That's true. Or, or the media might take the photo, but the editor doesn't choose the photo. Yeah. So yeah. That's also where the editing process comes in as well. Too. Yeah. I went looking for, for images of it. Find it. I have a look through myself. Yeah. 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 Kind of documenting the science because they don't last. Yes. So I found that's yeah, historically, yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. And has it changed constantly? Yeah. You know, from that eighty people up there yeah. to three. And something generally that the media looks for as well is shots that are more emotive. So if you want a shot that isn't drawing emotion out, or you know, unfortunately, violence, etc. So. Just if, you, if you're going to take a shot where there is something that has some level of violence, um, if you get a shot with a banner in the background, at least it's giving the, the message of why there, there is that violence and why yeah. you know, the arrest, as opposed to them being able to just label it the way they want to label it and then distort the message too. And I've tended to find, like, if I'm going to take something to the media, and I think that it's quite easily distorted, you know, easily distorted. I'd prefer to not provide that that, uh, that image yeah. and because then you don't want to get the wrong message across as well too. And something something that we spoke about too is it's always a good idea when you're photographing. When you're at a protest and you're in a public place, it, it, it is your right to photograph anything you want to photograph. Okay? But it is an idea if it is going to be a bit more of a personal shot, going to be right in front of someone or something like that. It's always a good idea to just, what I will do sometimes is I'll walk around and I'll just go look like this, just a little signal, and you'll find people will nod or something like that. Yeah. If you, otherwise you can you can stand further back and you can get a shot, because sometimes you might want to just get a spontaneous shot and just stand a bit further back and not right in their face. But it is your right at the end of the day, because it's deemed to be in public interest, and it's of historical interest too. It is your right to take a picture in a public place. Can I just mention here that if you, I, I can't imagine that you will, but if you are ever taking photos in Tonga, that doesn't apply. Right? You must have permission of the people to take photos and you can be jailed for it. 
It's the only so country. In, Tong in, in Tonga, 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 the law is that you must have permission to take photos of objects, of people, okay. um, like of buildings, you must have the owner's permission. Um, that's, and Tonga, also, bear that in mind if you're taking photos of islanders, uh, like Pacific Islanders, then certainly, because they might be fresh off the boat and they might be used to those rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. The most important thing is just respect, you know? Yeah. Respect is thing. Respect will get you a long way wherever you are. And you feel a sense of rapport or trust with the people you're photographing, and you'll find that they will allow you to come back if they know why you're there. That's always an important, an important part. You know, and also, for example, with Aboriginal people too, you know, when you, if you're going into an Aboriginal community, if you don't know someone there or someone hasn't invited you there, it's always a good idea to just speak to someone, find out how the people feel about you photographing and etc. It's always a good idea to with, do that. With the homeless community as well, um, yeah, there are a multiplicity of reasons why a lot of homeless people don't like being photographed. They range from having warrants out to um, uh, not wanting to be uh, contacted by family, um, just a whole uh, social embarrassment, there are a whole range of reasons. Um, there are actually very few homeless that I know that are prepared to be photographed. And uh, their, their reaction to be quite violent uh, if they feel that you transgress them. That's really interesting because I had, um, I was, last year I think, I was walking through the city with my daughter and someone who was really quite, I don't know, um, loud and everything just had this tiny little camera and just taking photos right in front of our faces and I didn't do anything about it. My daughter and I, we just kind of just kept walking or anything, but he was really quite in your face, didn't touch or anything, but really in your face, kind of paparazzi style, which was really different. <laughs> I thought maybe he's doing some kind of weird pro, um, project where he wants to catch people's reactions to him behaving that way. I don't know, it's really quite strange. Maybe you just just keep in mind too that you know we wouldn't have pictures today of the past if people couldn't take pictures yeah so you want to have records of this period of time as well you know, you want to be able to have records of protests that are going on now to inspire people in a hundred years' time. Yeah. To be able to see what people were fighting for now. And how they fought. And how they fought. Yeah. Well, yeah. And how they fought. And tactics and tactics and everything else. It's really good stuff. Also, <clears throat> one thing that I've always found very important is, especially in the days when there weren't that many cameras around in the sort of <laughs> mid mid-90s, that sort of thing. And I turn up at a, at a protest knowing that I might be the only camera there. And the cops, more often than not, will be a little bit more careful than not if they know there's a camera. Yeah. Which, you know, it's, it's just a, a, a security thing. I've got lots of photos of cops who have been fairly standoffish. One time, the first time capsicum spray was used outside Westpac Bank on Broad Street, and I got called by one of the protesters was during the Jabaluka period. He asked me to come around the corner quickly, and I get around the corner, and there's a cop with his hand just on his caps and comes straight. As soon as he saw me come around the corner, his hand dropped. They used it a bit later on, but still, you know, you can't avoid it. Also, I've been in situations where I've photographed protesters, and you might be the only record that there is of what's going on that is different to the cop's message. And I've had to go to court to support protesters because of the, the photos that act as evidence to support the case. And the cops will lie through their teeth and the judge will generally take me, as we all know, to take their side. If you've got photographic evidence or something that shows otherwise, at least you're providing a lot of extra support that way. Yeah. You know, and, and, it's, and it's important to see your role also as being um, an important part in, in, in what's going on. You know? 
and uh, you know, and so I suppose it gets onto you know your right to actually photograph it in a public place. As I'm saying, you're allowed to photograph anything. The only time a cop can stop you is if you are hindering their line of duty. You're allowed to photograph any cop. No cop can stop you photographing them. Yeah. It doesn't matter what they say. They can say. I don't want my photo to whatever it is. Yeah, You're entitled true. to They have done that. Yeah. Yeah. But the main thing is, if you are going to try, if you're going to be playing the role of the photographer during a protest, play the role of the photographer. Don't get involved in the activism right. side and then switch over to the photography because they will be watching you and they yeah. will see you in one place and see you in another place and they're going to label you. Yeah. So rather be the photographer the one day or the afternoon or for the hour or whatever it is yeah. and then be the activist a bit later on. Try and keep that distance. I generally I will generally wear clothes that are fairly in between activist, in between press. You don't want to be press to an activist and you don't want to be an activist to, to, to press it to sorry, you don't want to be an activist to the cops. If you look like an activist it's as if you found them like an activist, they're going to treat you as an activist and they're going to bundle you with everybody else. Yeah. If you look like press, sometimes the activists can get a bit funny about you taking their pictures as well too. And there's many times I've been able to, because the line gets blurred, the cops will accept me behind their lines to photograph behind and I can get what I need. And other times, you know, activists, um, you know, will let me come into their side, I'm not sure whether I'm media or an activist or whatever it is. And I also, just as a you know, a separate thing, because you know, after photographing so many protests, you get to know a lot of activists. And if you, what I try and do, without being rude or unfriendly to people, I try and keep a little bit of a distance, only because cops are watching. And if you go, oh, hi, how's your day? No, 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 all of this, they know where you are. Yeah. So just stand back. The important thing there is getting the shot. You can be friendly later on or just nod or whatever. And just keep your, keep your distance so that you can get the shot, which is good. Yeah, a question comes up. What do you do when the cops just grab your camera and try to do it? Well, they're not allowed to do that. You've done it several times. Okay, so best situation with this is then to have, and this is where it's useful, having people standing further back. Get people to record what's going on. Because that's illegal, and yes, it'll be your word against theirs. But if you've got someone else standing in the distance, and that's why, you know, with the way the media operates, I remember I, I was photographing uh, the uh, anti nuclear rights in Tahiti in 95, and we're on a runway, and there was uh, uh, tear gas and, uh, and rocks and stones passing over like this, and one of the media got in the way of the, of the military and they grabbed him by his backpack and they were going to carry him away and next thing all the press crowded around and photographed him. So you've got to look out for other activists with cameras. You've got to look after each other that way. Yeah. And you've got to be there as proof of proof. Right. So that way it gets recorded. And if they know they're being watched, the reason they're targeting you is because they're being watched. But if they know they're being watched while they're doing that, they're more likely to let it go. And again, that's where it's best to stay a little bit further back. It's no point trying to go in and getting a shot close up. You know, if you're going to get your camera grab, you're going to you know, you know, try and grab it. So rather than step back a little bit, stand back and get the shot from a distance if you need to. You put on a lens, it's going to bring so it in a bit closer. people who got arrested for the, um, for the Greek, for that Greek thing. And I think one of our, one of our people had her say, um, confiscated so over three months yeah, during the whole trial of it. And did they delete her phone as well? I can't remember if they deleted or which. No, what they, what they did was they said, you can't have it back, you have to write to us. Then they claimed they couldn't find it. Right. Even though it wasn't presented as evidence. It wasn't presented as evidence, it wasn't used as evidence. Um, and the magistrate said that they couldn't order the police to be in the so I went to the police and asked them how to get it back. And the, the iPhone was also taken. Yeah. And the iPhone had everything deleted on it, but the video camera still hasn't been returned. Right. So what do you do in cases like that? Then? 
Once it's look, once it's gone that far, this is why I say try and have your precaution. Yeah. And also with the cops, as much as they can piss you off and everything else, the best thing to do just be bite your tongue, be polite. Because the most important thing that you're doing there is getting the image. You know, even if they're really pissing you off, just be polite. And just the important thing is getting what you what you, what you need. That's yeah. the, that's the important thing. Not if they mouth off at you and you mouth back and the next thing you find, you know, you're getting caught up on the not just the so we're not permitted to record it. I, I, I rang up uh, the ABC about that. I rang up uh, um, uh, Channel 7 and I rang up the Arts Law Centre about that. None of them thought, they all found it a bit surprising. ABC said they'll check it up and spoke to cameramen and they never heard of it. Basically, you know, they'd be stopping people filming in video as well. Where they think that might, and I rang up the Arts Law Centre about it as well too. Where they think that might be coming under is the Surveillance Devices Act of 2007. But under that it says that you cannot, uh, that if a person uh, does not want to be recorded in a, in, in terms where it's breaching their privacy, they don't have to be. Right? But there's a couple of things. One, if you're in a public place, it's not really private. Yeah. So they can't claim that it's private. Yeah. And if they're going to claim that it's private, okay, then they can't arrest you. They, they can't arrest you for making a noise. Yeah. That's right. So it's a contradiction. Yeah. Now, the best thing that I've found, and I've had cops threaten me with arrest many, many, many times. If you know your rights and you state your rights, they are more likely to leave you alone. And what my general response is, I'm doing my job, you do yours. And, and that's why I say try and keep a little bit of that distance, try and stay back a little bit. Just don't, don't if, if they're busy doing something, make an arrest, just get out of the way. Because they will sense that you're working with them and you're being polite, but you will find your opportunity to get in there and get what you need to get. You know, it doesn't always have to be right there and then in that moment. If it means you're going to push in the way of the cop, he's going to get the shits and he's going to find something to get you anyway. So rather work with them, just, you know, to be like the be like the river. I remember, um, I think it was our second big protest up there, and that's when they had the riot. It was before, it was the, the protest before the eviction the next morning. So they had the riot cops all lined up. When I saw that, I completely lost it. I got my camera out, and I was just taking photos after photos of the cops just lined up. There was thirty oh, of them, and Vicky yeah. was counting them. <laughs> and I just completely lost it. I, I couldn't stop myself. I was just saying, you're kidding me. You are fucking kidding me. What the hell are you people doing here? I'm just taking photo, photo, photo. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it and I lost it. So I don't know how I can just not say anything. <laughs> you're saying something with the, with the camera? Yes. I was. Yes. <laughs> and that's, and that's, that's what your role is in that moment. Right. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just try, try as much as you can to keep, keep level-headed. I've had friends beaten up in front of me where I want to climb in as well too. You're yeah. more useful with the camera in, right. that, in that moment. Yeah. Because they need you to be there to document it. Yeah. So I don't know if anyone took photos of that lineup, but oh, I've got yeah. some really good photos of that lineup, and there was cops on horses. Like some of my shots were out of focus and everything, but you know you get that sense of line yeah. after line of police. Did you say you sent them the wing? Yeah. I did. Yeah, absolutely. And like, sorry, I was just going to say, like you were saying earlier with the capsicum spray when you went around the corner, during Hyde Park I was just watching, because we had that long row of cops, but then there was a couple of other cops standing in front, and there's big ruckus going on, they'd just taken away the guy from the tent situation. As they'd taken the guy away, his wallet had fallen out of his back pocket. So, and I saw it, so I scooped down to pick it up because I knew him. So I saw it and grabbed it, put it in my pocket, and obviously one of the cops must have clocked that, but just whatever. No big deal, I wasn't harassed or anything. Five minutes later, in not the lineup, but the next lineup in front, I watched a cop go from here 
grabbing his baton, flicking it out. So I've got hand, baton, and then I've got another pug coming over going, no, back, back in. I've got all three images, and then the next second, I've got the head cop coming over to me, threatening me that I'd stolen a wallet <laughs> 10 minutes earlier. And I was standing there and I just went, do I look like yes. I need to steal a wallet? Yes. I have a $5,000 camera. They stole you know. the person. Stole yeah. The person. yeah. Based on, exactly. yeah. And I was like, no, I know the guy. I said, I didn't steal the wallet. I picked it up for him before it got lost in the track. Yep. You know, so. And if they do that sort of thing, like what, what, what I find quite handy, is also sometimes just mingle with other photographers. Mm -hmm. If you see them, go, go up to other photographers so that they can see you with other people. This went during the, the uh, uh, World Economic Forum protest. I turned up just as they were pulling up the fences, and one guy was yelling at the cops, and he got arrested. And while he was getting arrested, I started taking some pictures. The next thing I had five cops coming up at me, pushing me against the wall, and wanting my ID. I then I saw a uh, friend that shoots for the Herald, called him over just as a little bit of extra support, so they could see someone with another camera, a bit more careful. He started taking my details down. I gave him my ID, and he was, because I live in Woolloomooloo, he was taking his time spelling Woolloomooloo. <laughs> so I said to him, you got my license? I said, again, I said, you did your job, I'm going to do mine, and I left him. I actually photographed him first in front of me, and then I left them and went to go and photograph the guy that was being arrested. So just try and act official, like you're there with a purpose. You're there. You are no different with a camera as someone working for a newspaper or for the media. It's an organisation that is a commercial run organisation. Just because they have got money and they employ many photographers, it's no different to a citizen. If you are photographing in a war zone, you come under the Geneva Convention as a citizen if you are press. Okay? You are a citizen filming. Any photographer working for a newspaper is a citizen filming. And it is your right in a public place supposedly in a democracy and in, in having free speech it is your right and it's important to stand up for that it's important to, to, to stand your ground i've documented many homeless people getting arrested in the cross the cops don't like it keep back you can tell them you're doing, you're doing your job and, and people people will the you know, cops will back off if you tell them what your rights are yeah because i've actually seen police just because I've been part of Occupy Sydney, I notice when police are harassing homeless people now and I've always wondered what is it, what can I do in that situation? Well, sorry, what Shay and I do, and it's mainly with young kids in the city, right? We see them just getting pushed up against the walls. Yeah. It's like, hey, would you play around something? Yeah, we need them too. But quite often they're just going to put kids. It's pretty ordinary kids, usually Asian or Lebanese or Arabic looking, whatever. Yeah. But the cops just walk up and get stuck into them. Yeah, you know, start pushing them against walls and all that. Shay and I just walk up to them. Yeah, you know, we in the two months we, we were away from Occupy, we were getting arrested twice a week for that. And it was very, very common. And so we take Sorry. We yeah, we, we just walk straight up and start talking, <coughs> and, and we always do that. And um, as soon as we get down to the police station, the local area commander just says, "Should let them go." Yeah, <laughs> and uh, usually it gets the kids let go as well. But we've had. I was about to ask you a question on this actually. We've, uh, we've had a couple of cops suggest to us that we weren't entitled to take photos of juveniles. Uh, and there are uh, like these legislation stopping you, uh, naming juveniles and all that. I wonder how I wonder how that played out. We, we just basically said, you know, it's a couple of ways. This legislation that you know, juveniles, it's a stop the The thing is that in a public place, you're entitled to photograph anyone that you want. You are not allowed to photograph by law. If you are standing in private property without permission, you can go into private property and then if they give you a warning, you can then leave if you need to photograph. You can photograph from a public place into private property 
as long as you're not being voyeuristic, you know, someone changing the clothes or something like that. There was something that Mickey Leaks used. He got told he could take photos in front of the um, American consulate. And so there are certain buildings that you can't photograph. It's generally like defence installations and that sort of thing. And there are some places where there are extra walls that you can't photograph, like down at uh, Hungbush, um, Opera House. Uh, this, you know, council restricted, Darling Harbour, casino, that sort of thing. That's interesting because I think I spent about an hour taking photos in the Opera House. Yeah, no, and no one said yeah, anything you, to me you about can, it. You can try and, you know, you can try and get away with it and if someone says something then you just, just move yeah, on. No one, yeah, no one knows. I was actually, photos of the opera. I was fascinated by the design of the tiles and everything and I was just wow, lost yeah. in my lens. I must have been there for about an hour just going around taking photos. No one said anything. Uh, so all those tourists are not supposed to be taking photos. Well, the thing is, the thing is that, if, that if it's if you're going to be where it's the, what they say is that if you're going to be using it for commercial purposes, so you set up with a tripod, uh, etc. With that one kind of question, and I'll take it. And just another thing I was going to mention: if you if you are wanting to do the media side of things, as in you know that's that's where you want to go, I would strongly suggest linking up with the Media Entertainment Arts Alliance. You can pay monthly and that way you're a member of an organisation and if something does happen, you can get support. They also give you a lot of legal information. You can go in and get help, etc, etc. And, and so it's something really worthwhile doing. Just check out their check check out their website as well too, and it's also very useful if you get a club passing your morning ID. It looks a bit more official too. You know. And it's just don't forget, like you know, I mean, I've been photographing activism for 20 years, and I consider myself an activist, and I can, you know, foremost, and, I, and I'm a, a photographer. But but for me, you know, you want to. You want to be able to have a situation where you keep a certain amount of efficiency and that's purely for your own security and your own protection. And sometimes up to you and ask you who you photograph before, you just say, oh, I'm freelance. You know, just, just keep it keep it as a... It's not also true, though, you don't have to spray any ID whatsoever. Um, it's not being arrested or if you are witness to a crime. If you witness to a crime, and they, they think you might be of help to them in some way, and that could be anything. You could be at a protest, and that's how they get away with it over there too. But the thing is, I think again, instead of causing confrontation, just work around it. You know, you can cause confrontation, and you can stand up for a particular situation if it's appropriate in that moment, and it's something that you really want to stand up for, and you're prepared to do it. But if you want to photograph, and you want to look to what's going on, and manage to stay there and walk away with your film. Try not to be confrontational. Can they demand that you read some pictures? No. 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 Regarding that point about uh, raising pictures when it's happening, uh, you know, they can get away with that. Other people that have cameras on them. So, uh, one of the, I guess, I assume, one of the game changing elements is that people like you go and sit there with your iPhone. And none of the images are being stored on the phone, they're being transmitted directly on the internet, you know, away from the location of life. Yeah. So there's nothing to complete. They might not produce the best photos, but there might, I suppose, be enough evidence there of seizing other people's photos who are getting yeah. you know, closer and getting good shots. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and the technology is changing. You, you never know, maybe in another few years' time, be uploading from like that. What we used to do in the days of uh, early days of uh, Indie Media, we, we'd actually, because uh, then it was just early days of digital, and we'd, we actually hired a, a van generator and we had it parked somewhere where actors would come and actually download the stuff. So you know, it's shifted from there to now people can walk around just with a, a handheld phone and 
just transmitted straight away. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's technology's good for us as well, too, you know, to change the technology. They can monitor us and, you know, provide the same thing. There are certain forecasts at the moment, and they're going to be able to to keep in mind too that when you're when, when you're photographing at a demonstration it's always a good idea like what I what I try and do is I, I try and stand back a little bit to get a sense of the vibe and the energy of what's going on. So a lot of the time you can find you know there'll be a lull and then suddenly there'll be a tiny bit of movement out of the corner of your eye and then you can head towards that if and it more sensitive you are to the energy of what's going on the more perceptive you'll be just getting there at that right moment to, to capture the image. It's always good, like, you know, the day when the cops came in, that, uh, when they uh, grabbed those two guys up there and the rest of them up on West Bank, oh, yeah. like the, night before, the, the night before they came in. I was sitting, I was actually on the phone to my girlfriend saying, oh, there's not much happening, I'm going to come back. And I was sitting there having coffee, and then I saw all the cops for the whole time up till then were standing around fairly casually. And then I just saw three cops looked just a little bit more official, like they're about to do something. Yeah. And I saw them moving like that, and as I saw them moving, I moved towards them. Nothing was going to happen, that's not going to happen. And that way, you stay perceptive of everything that's going on. And being there at that time is what's important. Yeah. So that's what's going to get them in the picture too. And then when it brings me up with my other thing, just be careful as well, giving you photos and tell as many photos as you can. Keep, keep, be careful handing over your photos to to the commercial yeah. um, media because they will firstly like there was that one guy the one morning when we got pushed out towards Hyde Park yeah. and there's one guy there trying to gather all the they're saying you know I'll look after your footage and I'll get it out there. Yeah. 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 So then, just just be careful because they will use it, they can, they're making money off it, and yeah. they will distort it the way they want to distort it. Yeah. And he might um, even be a cop. You know, that guy I know, he's, I've seen him around, but, uh, but, but, yeah. but, but the, the, the thing is that, you know, one thing that I've been trying to keep on bringing up and bringing up, bring up, especially in photography, the photographer doesn't have a right, a right to um, write their own captions. Okay. The, the editor can do that, so they can twist the story. If, you if you've got a photo, if you've got a photo and you don't want it used without a particular caption, you tell them that. Make it very clear. And if you're handing over images, make sure you find out what the story is, what the storyline is going to be, etc., etc. You have full control. Of this. Just, just getting your photo published somewhere isn't doesn't necessarily mean anything. If you feel a connection to your work and what you're actually photographing, you want to have as much control over that as possible. Yeah. What's that? Just the body in the What's that? The restrictions you're placing. Well, if you're emailing it, put it in the email. Be clear and put it in the email. It's a contract. They cannot, they cannot use it without you know, sticking to whatever you stipulate. You can also, if your photos with software, you can embed metadata, which is information connected to the photo, yeah. so that they can see that it's copyright. And also, one other important thing too is if you do let them giving a photo over, firstly, you can charge them and make money off you, okay? Firstly, you know, it's going to help support your activism. Yeah. They're selling ads and they're making money off you. Secondly, it's also a good idea to mention not for archival use with your photo because they will keep it on their files and they'll reuse it and reuse and reuse it in all different contexts that they want to use it for and you'll probably find the photo gets used in, in the bloody business section you know supporting mining or something like that yeah. you know so if you say not for archival use it means that once they've used it in the way that you can read to they can't reuse it without coming back to you and getting permission yeah. stick a little copyright symbol as much as you know there's a whole thing about you know the copyleft movement and 
you know, etc. and sharing. I'm happy to share my photos with activists and, and non-commercial organisations for it to be used for, for nothing yeah. if they're going to be using it for that. Yeah. But if they're going to make money off it, first they're going to make sure it's the right message. Yeah. And secondly, charge them to say if they can make money off you. Yeah, um, yeah I just want to do it on Facebook. What's that? Facebook now, um, when you join Facebook, you have to actually say you do it. You do not get the permission to do Because Facebook now has a thing which says that they can they own your photographs once it goes on. Yeah, it's always been the case. Yeah, when you're when you're doing putting photos up um that you've taken and that my sites too, just be a little aware and considerate that um particularly if you make Public, that they just might be incriminating in the prosecution. So, uh, and, and, and as well, if you're going to, you know, say more sensitive areas where, you know, you know, like if you say, for example, if you're photographing something like the scenes and there's some, you know, revolutionary group or whatever it is, and, yeah. and you go and show the faces of the people, you just make sure that they're okay with that. Yes. Over here, it's not as serious. You know? yeah. But there have been situations, there was one, I remember going to a talk and this one uh, press photographer was talking about how he was photographing in, in, uh, in El Salvador and uh, he had been in the mountains photographing one of the revolutionary groups there and because they became familiar with him they started taking off their bandanas and they showing him his face. And one of his roles of film that he sent back to Time magazine had their faces in but he said to the editor, don't use the photos showing their faces. And they did. And his his hotel happened to be my office in the house. And it arrived, the time magazine arrived on the on the uh, the, uh, the, the lounge uh, area there. He yeah. opened up, saw his photo, but he had to go into the mountains and warn the people to go into hiding. Because things can be that sensitive. It's not as bad over here, you know, but it is what if it is gonna be you know, uh, if it's serious it's in the same. Yes. I got really angry if an American changed the law that she put out a documentary of all these people and showed their faces. And it was like, oh yes, they're doing great, wonderful revolution and stuff. And it was like, you stupid bitch. You've just put all these people's lives in the Well, that's where you've got to make sure that the people are happy to, if, especially if it's a personal interview or something like that. At some places they do. Yeah. You know, some places that you go to, like in the, when I was documenting uh, the effects of mining in the Philippines, there were communities that actually volunteered particular people in the community to be what they call exposed. Yeah. So they willingly will expose their faces to be a, a symbol for the community of what's going on and to aware of the consequences. And they don't mind you doing that. So, you know, again, it's just like I was saying in the beginning, just like the respect, the sensitivity of, of the people that you photograph is, is insane. The other thing that I noticed too when Occupy started, I was kind of involved in some of the, the free meetings. I had people come up to me and randomly take my photo on the street. That's never happened to me forever. Yeah, that's okay. Just take yeah, the picture. Many times, and, and you know what? More often than not, I'll turn my camera on there and start taking pictures of them, yeah. and then they stop. Okay. You know, and it was actually there was one incident I remember a few years ago. And there was a demonstration coming down um, past um, Parliament House here, <clears throat> and I was watching, and there was an ambulance coming from behind, and two Channel 10 guys, there was a spotter, you know, the guy that spins them around, points in the right direction because they've got their eye on the camera so they can't see what's going on. Yeah. He spun the, he spun the, the, the Channel 10 guy around and I was watching where he was pointing and it was right towards the back of the protest with the ambulance coming out. I thought, that's going to be the new story. How the protest has blocked the path of the ambulance. Not what the message was, but yeah. it was a tiny... And I walked straight up to this guy and I said to him, 
but but you took my camera and I had a one and so I went right up to his face and the one is called channel 10 page yeah and photographed him first and then I said if I see that on the news tonight I said I'm gonna plaster your face all over the internet I said, and he said what are you talking about I said you know exactly what you're doing I said you know how you're gonna use it and I'm telling you now if you if you put this up on, on TV in the way that I saw you taking this your face is gonna be plastered everywhere I don't like to see anything, but I don't think it had any effect on it. But the thing is, it also makes the media the way you The same thing happened with the 10 embassy, the 3rd anniversary. Because uh, he, he didn't realise what he was doing, and he had a, he had a balaclava on. And the elders hadn't quite got to him yet to tell him to take it off. Yeah. And next thing, the media were all around him. And I walked up to him and I said, I said, it's probably not a good idea to have that on because they're not going to make you look very good and they're going to use your picture in a bad way and he wasn't sure what to do and another elder came up and, and then they walked up to the cameraman keep the cameraman honest too yeah. let them do their job because they've got to do their job too because we need media right but make sure it's an honest job too and if they don't photograph them too oh, i've got that in the Well, you can actually, you know, let, I know that it's cost and everything else, but you can actually get defamation too if they're defaming your character and they're using it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's two. It's the organisation. Well, even you as your personal character. Um, because there's two, there's two, you know, copyright issues. It gets broken up into two areas. One is intellectual property, right? So you can find out that the copy is without your permission and without your name attached to it. Right? That's the first thing. Secondly, there's moral rights. The moral rights of your, of your work is basically that your photo is represented with the intention that you originally had to take it. So if you've taken a photo in a particular way, they can't distort the message. In the same way, if they tell an untruth about you, whether it's a photo or in writing, and they defame your character, it's the same thing as well. So your moral rights are, 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 are very important as well, too, besides your intellectual rights. And that reminds me of the case of the states, though, where Jane Edwin came from. Jane Edwin was a journalist, and she wrote 300 letters to her. And um, Fox won the, uh, won the case against uh, I beat her um, just on the basis that uh, there's no law that says they can turn it through. And so they can do the truth for a while. And if they, if, if you can show that it's a different Strategies there, whereby so Christopher Hitchens published 
simple uh, very provocative look about Mother Teresa. There's an awful lot of suspicious stuff about Mother Teresa. And there's a history of doing that in order to get to take you to court so you can tell the world what you really, you know, what your evidence is for those claims on the stand. And that's what happened, for example, in the Dreyfus, you know, in the France in the late 19th century. They arrested this uh, Jewish officer on the basis of the Dutch farms, uh, committed treason. In fact, it was, it was some other some other Frenchman who had done this. But then they covered up the fact that it wasn't this guy that kept him in prison. And Bill Zola wrote a famous letter. And it all ended up in trial in a uh, like defamation suit, which was his intention because he was he had he had a case to make. And he said, Well, I'll write a letter, they can sue me, and let's argue about it in court. I'm right, they're wrong. So, in, in the case of like Mr. Hitchens and maybe Chris Masters or Alan Jones, that's what they're provoking. And in those cases, the fish didn't provide because they knew from the court they had to make a case that would be the case. And, and, and maybe you will lose the court case, but still, it's out of the public, yes. the Obviously. facts that support the case. Yes. And one, one, one last thing too is to also just, um, <laughs> if, you, if you've taken photos, just keep in mind, like especially for the, 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 the press, is that you know, usually by early afternoon, about 2.30, 3 o'clock, all the editors sit down have a discussion about what's going to be going in the paper for the next day. Right. So if you've got your photos ready, try and get them in before that, or give them a call before that, so that it becomes part of the discussion in the meeting. Because once they've already sort of allotted the pages and everything else, it's a lot harder getting something in afterwards. It's usually the cut of time, it's like around 7 o'clock, somewhere around there. Unless something major has happened that they think, well, we've got to include it. They can't even think twice about it, that's really about the space.